Today our topic is suicide prevention. The first part of the topic is rather sad because it is the self-destruction of human life. But the second part of the topic is a hopeful one that one can reach out and attempt to prevent, help people, prevent that way of dealing with whatever life problems they have. In order to do this, I want to ask you to please identify if you have heard or known of any situations of attempted suicide or suicides that have been committed in the past year in terms of the age, gender, marital status, mode of attempting, cause for attempting, and any warnings given. Who would like to be? Sir? Age was 30 years, right? Yes, sir. Then he is a male. Male, sir. And uh, he is married. Unmarried, sir. He was single. And how did he attempt? He did not attempt, sir. He tells he'll attempt suicide because of his physically handicapped. He has not yet done anything? Not done anything, sir. OK. So not attempted yet, but he right? is handicapped, sir. Handicapped. And in terms of warnings, he's keeping on giving warnings. Yes, sir. Saying, life is not worth life living. Is not this worth is too it. much to bear. Why should I live? Right? Yes. Who else would like to tell? Please. She is a female. Female. I'm 20 years. 20 years. Single. This happened in a hostel, sir. And she was living in a hostel. And how did she attempt? She hanged herself to fan. Through hanging to a fan, she attempted. And luckily, her friends saved her. Yes. So it became an attempt. Why did she do that? She got very less marks in examinations. OK. And she may not uh, enter to the PG course. Failure in exam. While she was struggling with less marks and all that, was she becoming unhappy and depressed prior to no, attempting? She didn't give any warning. Not verbally. But was there a change in her behavior or appearance or general condition? I mean, she usually keeps herself alone. OK. She so works hard by reading. She, she was keeping alone, right? Aloof, not reaching out, correct? See, sometimes that itself is a warning. You know, this is happening to a certain number of young people finishing high school and college. But I'd like to have one more person, please, share. Yes. 23-year-old, sir. 23-year-old. Male. Male. Unmarried. Single, yes. Uh, he died, sir. How? Hanged. Hanged. And here is an instance of uh, actual committing suicide in the sense that that person died. Compared to the earlier instances of attempt and the other, not yet attempted, but threatening. Then why did this person do that? For not having jobs. Unemployment. And when this person was struggling with the job, he would, would have mentioned to some friends that it is frustrating and exasperating that this no, person... No, sir, his behavior was totally different. He doesn't use to sleep during nights. Uh -huh. He used to feel sleeplessness like that. For some time, mm. right? So there was a change in his behavior to sleeplessness. That shows how deeply upset and anxious and worried and struggling he, he must have been. So sleeplessness. Gastric trouble also. And other physical problems were there. Our gastrointestinal system is highly vulnerable to emotional distresses. Now, if I said to you, more young people are attempting suicide, you might think it is an academic comment. How do you know it is true? But you have yourself mentioned, you see, if you take the average of the age that you have given, 30, 20, 23, and I'm sure if we go around, a vast number of the people you know are also people somewhere around 35. There can be exceptions, of course. So when we talk about incidents, what we talk about is that, first of all, historically, suicide had occurred in all cultures, in all ages, meaning historical epochs, as well as all age groups, 
for variety of reasons. Secondly, that suicide had taken a different kinds of meanings at different times also. For example, some centuries ago when uh, in the northern part of our country invaders were coming and you know Rajasthan, Punjab, these areas were most vulnerable to these attacks. They were the ones who really protected the country by giving their lives all those times. So what had happened was with these invading armies had not only plundered, got their booty, but were also taking captive women, children, raping and causing very strong inhuman violation of human rights. At that time, some of the women there decided that it is better to die in honor along with our husbands rather than be subjected to this humiliation and horror. So that is how Sati originally came. Now subsequently when it was no longer necessary to continue, our Indian reformers themselves changed both the social patterns and forbade it, it in law. So un, except in rarest of rare instances in some very remote village of highly illiterate population, you don't anymore hear about that. Then you had a you know, whole case of farmers committing suicide in the recent past, a good number in Andhra Pradesh, through successive droughts, indebtedness really became suffocating for these poor people and they thought the best way is to no longer live. Then you are also finding along with terrorist movements a formidable situation of suicide bombers. You know, they are ready to give their life and this has happened in all different places in the world. They believe in their cause so deeply that they are prepared to die. Now whether the cause is right or wrong is a different question. But that's a very difficult thing to be. But what I'm talking about is not that type of suicide. What I'm talking about is suicide that is being attempted or committed by people due to psychosocial pressures in their life. A scientific study took place in the early 50s when the Los Angeles Police Department found some notes left by people who had killed themselves. And when they read it, they couldn't make sense of it. So they called a psychiatrist, a few clinical psychologists and others and asked them to study and say, what do these mean? What can we learn from it? How can we use that information to help people? They studied these notes and came with the following conclusions, among others. One, suicide attempt or even threat of suicide is a call for or a cry for attention or affection. That somehow whatever they are doing to overcome their difficulties, they are not succeeding. That 75% of the people who attempt suicide actually give a warning of one type or another, direct or indirect, but most of the people don't take them seriously. The reason, something like this, a barking dog seldom bites. So people think if he really wants to kill himself, why is he talking about it, right? But unfortunately, 75% of the people who have attempted suicide or committed suicide had given warnings which were not understood, therefore not addressed. So that was one of the major finding of this study. So we, if we can understand what these warnings are or what these clues are, we will be able to anticipate and understand and deal effectively with people. Now the magnitude of the problem is, before we look at the warnings, 1,000 people every day are committing suicide in the world. This is released by the World Health Organization. The second factor is that for every successful suicide, so-called, there are 10 attempts. In other words, there are 10,000 attempts per day. Now in the world, in any nation, we have three major resources. How we deal with them determines what kind of quality of life we will build for people. One is non-renewable resources like solar energy, like wind energy. Non-renewable are things like coal or 
hydrocarbons and you know wood such things ecological disaster comes if do, we do not have 33 percent of the land mass as vegetation now the third and most important resource is the human beings how the human beings develop what opportunities they get and what initiatives they take to make use of those opportunities because you can take a horse to the pond but you cannot make the horse to drink the water at the same time if the horse goes to the pond and there is no water it cannot drink water so there is a reciprocal responsibility of society and the individual in this what happens is human beings are born as becoming entities in other words when we are born we don't have all the skills and our potential developed it is there in an embryonic form but with the opportunities they get through good nutrition good parenting good environment good opportunities to go to school the possibility to develop their potentials then the possibility to use their potentials their being fulfilled their being able to contribute to the development of the society at large in other words human beings will then if they are developed properly become assets rather than liabilities producers rather than only consumers contributors rather than parasites that's where education also comes into the picture and from a human rights point of view every human being who is alive who is yet to be born has an inherent right to have three square meals in other words a balanced diet clean drinking water shelter over their head opportunity to develop their skills talents values and potentials and to use them suitably for the well-being of the whole man of mankind so it is in this context when you see suicide is a diminution of life it is a destruction of life scientists say 75% warned and if we understand their warnings or clues we can help them to live there is a very hopeful situation how worldwide this is happening out of 100,000 people according to the world health organization Hungary 48 suicides per 100,000 Finland 37 Austria 31 Sweden 31 Federal Republic of Germany 28 in India, they mention six to nine. Now, I have a feeling that statistics in India are not accurate. Reported statistics are the tip of the iceberg of the real statistics that are not reported. And there is also one interesting reason for not reporting, one or two. One is, there is stigma attached to people. You know, somebody says he attempted suicide. We tend to look down on them as weak, so they don't feel like telling. So it is suppressed. Secondly, Indian law, unlike law of many other countries, considers suicide attempt as punishable. Therefore, it becomes a medical legal case. So if somebody goes to the hospital or taken to the hospital and says, this fellow swallowed some poison, immediately doctor is duty bound to call the police. And you know what happens after that. It's a tragedy. So people don't report. So I don't believe in this six to nine as accurate. So there must be more, as much as in other countries, and even more. So now this amount of human resources waste is a loss. And in our country, as our president Abdul Kalam said on, in his speech on the Republic Day, something like 540 million people in our country are young people, are young adults tremendous human resources we cannot afford to lose if we become a superpower in the world it is going to be because of the potentials of these 560 million actualized there are 261 million or so who are below the poverty line
So in this context, I just want to say, what are these clues? What are these warnings? And how can we understand them? So incidents you have seen, 1,000 per day, 10,000 attempts. This is all according to WHO. Now the second thing is, what are the clues or the warnings people give? I would like to talk about six types of clues very quickly. You have said that somebody actually warned verbally, right? So one type of clue is called the verbal clue. Verbal clue means what the person says. Now, number of times, when a person says directly and clearly and unambiguously, I want to kill myself, the message is clear. They may not do it, but they are giving a warning. I'm really suffering. It's becoming too much for me. It's a call for, cry for, attention, affection, and rehabilitation. Our rehabilitation facilities for the disabled are very poor. Part of the verbal warning is indirect warning, which are more difficult to detect. One person told me that a relative of his came and said, you know, I think this is the last time I'm going to be meeting you. And the other one laughed, saying, why do you say that? I don't think we'll meet again soon. Then he heard that he attempted suicide. What he was trying to tell was, you know, really something is happening. I want to alert you. And other people say, this is the last examination I'm going to attempt. That means if this fails, I'm going to attempt suicide. This has also happened. I'll tell you one instance where a young man came to meet me. He told me, sir, I know you're dealing with this kind of subject, so I want to ask you a question. I have a friend who is 22 years old. He's very handsome. He's very able. He has leadership qualities. He has so many other good qualities. He's a very popular person in the college. But you know, deep in his heart, he's feeling so bad, so distressed. He feels life is not worth living. What should I tell him? I said, you know, there is no standard formula that you tell anybody. First important thing is befriend him and listen to him. What is he going through? Because when the pain in the heart comes out, a person may feel lighter and be able to think more rationally. It's not so much what you tell, but what you listen. Just like a doctor doesn't heal you, but he facilitates healing. We are catalysts to help. We help the person to solve. So listening becomes very important. After listening, you encourage him to take a look at what are different ways of solving this. One is to kill yourself. Well, it, will it really solve the issue? If there are others, shall we consider all of them? Then if he still persists, take him to a professional, a doctor or a counselor or a psychiatrist. But then I told him, in case you are that young person, don't hesitate to talk to me. I'm available to you. I'll be of service to you. I'll help you to look at other alternatives. He got a shock. He said, how did you know that it was me? I said, I don't know. I cannot explain. But I felt that you are talking to me about yourself in the third person. This is what I'm saying. So that is indirect verbal clue. We, I can be wrong in assuming, so it is important to check. Then what happened was he said, now that you have identified it is me, I, I, will, I would like to talk with you. And we talked together for a long time and met three, four, five times again. And then he decided to leave. If I miss that clue, he would have gone and I don't know what he would have done. Second clue is behavioral. Now this also you mentioned. His behavior was very different, you said. So when the behavior changes drastically from the normal behavior in terms of heavy mood swings or odd behaviors that you haven't seen, it is important to ask, why is this person doing like that? What is going on within him? And offer a hand of friendship. I suddenly see you different. You are such an outgoing person. You are now not coming out of your room. Is everything all right? Some people have done, they simply went and paid all their bills in the 15th of the month when they normally do it on the 3rd of the month. Because they didn't want anybody else to have the obligation. It's a sudden different behavior, right? Third one is, again you have given this, situational. 
what is happening in the life of the person. In this person, he is experiencing disability. Right? Distress that goes with this. And it is chronic. Here, she failed in an exam. It was very distressing and disappointing for her. Somebody else is without jobs. Somebody else might say, you know, I love this person, but he's now, by circumstances or choice, is getting married to somebody else. I am heartbroken. Haven't you heard things like that? Yes. Right? Some people, through abject poverty, have taken their family and jumped into a well. So there are varieties of reasons. Alcoholics and drug dependents also tend to be in that category because 30% of all suicidal attempts are accounted for by alcoholics and drug dependents, substance abuse. Many people fail. Why did this person attempt? Many people have chronic illnesses. Why few are attempting suicide? This leads to our looking at a fourth factor called symptomatic. Symptomatic means how is the person reacting? So far we have looked at verbal, what is the person saying directly or indirectly? Second, behavioral, how is the person behaving in terms of their moods and activities? Is it significantly different from their normal pattern? Third one is what is happening in the life of the person? Failed in exam, failed in love affairs, lost money, indebtedness, chronic illness, disability, substance abuse, what have you. Fourth one is symptomatic is how is the person reacting? See, one of the fundamental things about life is an event doesn't lead to an action. The way we interpret the event leads to an action. So there are two basic ways. One is a negative way of reacting to life could lead to suicide. One is to say, oh, there is no problem. Secondly, this is not my problem. Therefore, I don't have to do anything. Hence, I don't even seek anybody's help. Consequently, if somebody offers help, I won't accept it. But when I really face the realities of all the things, I will blame somebody else. This is a negative attitude. And whatever I do will not change the situation. The positive attitude is, yes, there is a problem. At least part of the problem is part of the problem is mine, not all. I will do something within my control and power to change that. I will even not mind asking somebody who knows better for their help. And if somebody offers me help, I won't hesitate to accept it. Accept the reality and go forward. So we want to look at how they are reacting. Five is descriptive clue. Descriptive clue means, how do you describe this person? A person who is younger and says he's more vulnerable now, right? A person who is in terrible distress for a long time. A person who is highly depressed. When you are very depressed, suicidal thoughts come more often. A person who has attempted but not resolved the underlying issue is likely. A person who is abusing alcohol, substance, other substances is more likely. These are descriptions we need to watch. Finally, we are talking about resources. Does this person have a positive attitude or a negative attitude? That is personal resources. Person who has negative attitudes, he's at risk. Person who is optimistic is resilient. Does his family and friends support him? Do they have good relationships? That is a resiliency factor. What about other social community resources? Do, does that person have access to a doctor, a bank, a lawyer? These things. So the more there are, the more resilient that person becomes. If they are not there, then one of our jobs is to link them to those things. Stimulate the positive side of them to come up. Link them to connect to the friends with whom he has not been utilizing their support. Or that family member who is likely to be more sympathetic than others to connect. That doctor to whom they have been avoiding to go. See, by setting that up, you are going to increase the resources. Now, when you do that, changed from trauma to transformation, from destruction to construction. First of all, we can have awareness about these issues so that people know that these thoughts can be overcome. Two, in our attitudes, have a positive attitude to failures. Thirdly, 
to make available telephone crisis counseling services and others so that those who are in distress can be met. And when we know somebody, give a friendly hand, give a listening ear, give a word of comfort, give a word of encouragement, refer them to the right resources and we can save many of these people. I can take one question or two. One of my relatives recently got uh, breast cancer operated. Uh -huh. uh, so now she is in, I don't know if she is in total depression. She has undergone uh, chemotherapy as well as radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, she says that, okay, why should I only suffer? Yes. There are more elderly people than me. Yes. So why should I suffer? Yes. So is that one of the warnings she is giving or how, how to deal with it? So. She is struggling with a situation uh, which is normal for that condition. I mean, she has gone through so much. Apparently, she is a younger person. She is about 40 years. Yes. What she needs is to experience that despite whatever has happened to us, the people around her still value her, love her, care for her, appreciate her. Now, if she goes into too much depression, of course, and stays there, sometimes medication can help, but medication can only be a support. The most important thing is a chance for her to work through this. So many times what happens is somebody diagnoses something, they almost cease to live. Once I came across a person who was much older and had cancer, and they gave her six months. She was depressed. Six times I went and listened and listened and listened. She started coming out. At that time, I asked her, now what do the doctors say? They say, she said, I have six months. And I'm so much in shock, I'm not able to do anything. I said, now how about, you have six more months. How do you want to live these six months? I hope you live longer. She said, you know, I never thought about that. I'm almost living like a dead person. It's called posthumous existence. Then she started thinking, oh, I can do this today. I can do this today. Within six months, I can accomplish all those. Went home, came back for a checkup, just to say, I've done all those things I wanted to do. I've handed over to a successor my job. Now I am at peace. And if tomorrow I die, I'm ready to go, she said. We were shocked. But, you know, for a person who has benign cancer, the chances of living are very bright. Right? So once her pain comes out, the messages of the doctors will sink in. And slowly, if she begins to do things each day, little by little, more and more, and be surrounded by love and acceptance and encouragement, she should have a good future.